I shall not be moved. We thank you. Now I pray that as I look at your word, bless your people. Bless your people. Use this word not to only entertain us at all, but challenge us. Thank you for another day of prayer and fasting. And as we continue, we will hear from you that this week be a tremendous one. We are praying for a great outpouring of your spirit. That the will of God be done in this assembly. Have your way, Father. Now use me for your honor and glory. That at the end you will receive the glory. Meet your people at the point of their needs. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Preaching the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ as we continue with the essential ministry of the Holy Spirit. Preaching the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the fact that his sacrifice is therefore a perfect satisfaction to the holy law of God and a perfect offering to satisfy his holy wrath. He then receives Christ to his right hand. And so what are we preaching here when we talk about that? We are preaching the great doctrine of substitution. We don't have the time to deal with that, but at start that started way back in Genesis. The great doctrine of substitution. We are preaching the great doctrines of propitiation. And of course we preach judgment. And that means the judgment of the prince of this world. And all who are a part of his kingdom of darkness. We must preach that. We preach eternal judgment we preach eternal hell we preach eternal wrath eternal retribution you better believe those things are going to come to pass the spirit of god works to produce these things but what the spirit of god needs is the word of god to be proclaimed in these categories in order to do his work. That's why we have to preach those things. Because I told you the spirit works in tandem with the word. A lot of people are in church but never heard the gospel yet. And by the way, I must warn you while praying and fasting. I believe the Lord would have me preach on the gospel. Next. Because I've discovered I'm asking people to share their faith. 90% of people in church building don't know what is the gospel. Oh, it's going to get difficult in here. We don't know what the gospel is. So God, as I was praying, he said, preach. We're going to share the good news, but you have to say what it is. At least we preach our own thing. At least we tell people what we think is the gospel. Hello! And so that, I'm beginning to think about that, and I'll do some more as the Spirit would lead me. And so they are literal all throughout the pages of Scripture. All throughout the pages of Scripture. These truths, over and over again, rehearsed in the Old Testament by way of prophecy and type and symbol, and all throughout the New Testament. See if you find this card. And listen to what 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. And how it reads. Our gospel did not come to you in word only. Come on now. But, oh come on, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. In other words, when you preach the gospel, in the power of the Spirit, 
Whenever you preach the gospel in the power of the spirit, he produces conviction. People are not being convicted because we are not preaching in the power of the spirit. God of mercy. If I want to evangelize somebody, if I want to preach a message that can really change the heart of people, the first thing I have to understand, listen to those who will be going out and evangelizing, listen carefully, is that I can't do it. Oh, Lord Jesus. You can't save anybody. You can heal anybody. There is only one God. There is only one Savior. There is only one Lord. Oh, oh God, oh God. If I want to evangelize, that's the first thing we must understand. If I want to preach a message that will stir the hearts of people, I need to understand I can't do it. I can't do that on my own. There is only one who transforms people. I don't care how eloquent you are, how externally beautiful and comely you look, what a lovely voice you may have. There is only one that brings conviction. There is only one that can cause a stony heart to be made flesh. There is only one that can cause us to be born again. And that is the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need God again in our churches. Say amen, somebody. Yeah, there's only one. I can't do it. Only the Holy Spirit transforms people. So I want to ask the question, what is it that the Spirit does? What is it that the Spirit of God uses to begin the work of conviction? How is it we can sit in church and not feel convicted? How is it I can argue with my wife and then come and say, It's getting hot in here. I won't say the other part because that's so. Uh, before I leave home, I have to ask Chinese girl. I'm glad she's not here. Praise God. For forgiveness, I'm sure my life is right because I'm not coming here to play. Because God will hold me accountable. Read the book of James. Those who teach this word, he will hold accountable. Are you hearing me? How is it we don't feel convicted? You know why? We have made God's house a house for entertainment where people are so comfortable in their sins because all we preach is blessings, spin around, six times shout and you will be blessed and taken to another level. But it's time we preach the whole counsel of God. The Holy Spirit must convict people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment which is to come. But unless we preach it, it is the Holy Spirit who produces, are you ready, repentance. We cannot do that outside of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who produces repentance. And it is the truth about sin and the truth about Christ and the cross and the truth about judgment. Secondly, if we are going to begin at the beginning, we have to understand it is the Holy Ghost that produces conviction. Nobody else, no theatrics. It is the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'm confident that precisely what we have in the 11th chapter of Acts, in the 18th verse, I am confident that's precisely what we have in the 11th chapter of Acts in the 18th verse. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, 
Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Only God can do that. Only God can make a sinner repent. Only the Holy Spirit. Hello, we can have all the church rules. Only the Holy Spirit can make a sinner feel convicted. And how did this come about? If you notice prior in Acts, how did the Gentiles repent? How? Why? If you notice prior in Acts, earlier in verses, and then in verse 50, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. God wants to use your intellectual capabilities. He's not afraid of your education. He wants you to be educated. Education and God are not oxymorons. You should be and have a great education. But when you come to minister before God, you must let everything take a second place and say, have thy own way with me. Use me for your honor. I've seen eloquent people. I've seen gifted people perform Oh, and people clap. And it was a tremendous performance. And then I've seen anointed people. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, this God is an awesome God. Yes, he will take lowly fishermen. Yes. And when he's finished with them, he'll turn the world upside down. Yes. Because when he infuses them with the power of his Holy Spirit, I thank God that he allowed me to go to university. And to acquire a degree, I thank God for it. But when it comes to ministry, my education must only complement. But it must never be the main thing. The main thing is being endued with power from on high. So when I stand to minister, it is not I that live it, but it's Christ. Oh God, I feel him. That lives inside of me. I want him to get the glory and to get the honor. Only the Holy Spirit can convict people. The Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did on us at the beginning. Verse 17, I'm still in Acts. God gave to them the same gift that he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus. Because the same Spirit who came upon us is the same spirit who came upon them. It's the same spirit who had prior to that granted them repentance. Same spirit. The same spirit produces conviction and sin. The same spirit. Conviction about the truth of the cross. You can't be serving Jesus faithfully and have people in your heart. Something is wrong. I don't care who you are. You need to go back to Calvary. Tell Jesus I sent you back to Calvary. You cannot be a child of God. Sit in God's presence and not forgive people. There is a hole in your salvation. Once you love Jesus, people may hurt you. People may step on your toes. But because of the goodness of the living God, you have to. You cannot sit in his presence. You can't pray for people that you hate. Oh, the church has gone so far from God. People are worshiping next to people they don't like. They tell people statements that can't stand the blessing. God of mercy. And we want to know why he's not moving. He's not moving because his church is filled with filth. And he's got to burn away the dross. Sin must have no place in his presence. For the ground upon which thy foot standeth is holy ground. When you come to him, you have to come like the sinner beating upon his breast. Forgive me, have mercy upon me. For I am a sinner. You cannot. Oh, Jesus. Some people haven't said sorry in two decades. Some 
something is wrong. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. You can't pray. You can't pray and fast. Pray and fast. First thing you will do, you'll cry to God. That's the first thing. The minute you stop, oh God, the minute you step in His presence, oh God, you don't understand. I tell you, we take grace to another level. Oh God, under the old covenant, we would not be alive. They have to tie a rope around the high priest. Because you don't go into the Holy of Holies with any tinge of sin. They'll have to pull you out. But today, we walk in bold in our sin, in our iniquities. Rather than before we come, we say, Lord, wash me with your word. Forgive me. Let your blood fall upon me again. Wash my mind. Wash my thoughts. Wash my speech. I have not been a good girl. I have not been a good boy. Cleanse me, Father, as the deer panted for the water brooks. So my soul is longing after you. Wash me, Father. Clean me, Father. Oh, God, now I'm ready to come into your presence and to sing holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty who was and who is. Wash me, Father. I can't lift holy hands. They are not holy. Haven't you read your Bible? Who shall ascend? Oh God, the holy hills of God. He that have clean hands. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God have mercy. Oh, that's what we should be praying and fasting for. Wash me, Jesus. And then watch him move in the assembly. Watch him move. Watch him move. Families must get back together. Husbands and wives. Don't come and pray in fast. Get it right first. Then come. Yeah, tell him, oh God, heal or fracture. Heal this relationship. Heal it, Jesus. By the Spirit of God, heal it. Heal it. By the Spirit of God, heal it. So we can bring glory. Oh, let me finish and get on out of here. It is the Spirit. It is the Spirit. It is the Spirit that produces conviction about sin. Conviction about the truth of the cross, which is related to sin and our sinfulness. And the only hope we have to escape judgment. And the Spirit produces conviction about judgment in order to produce repentance. Mm -hmm. And of course we can add, let's look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1 verse 12. 1 Peter 1 verse 12. The Spirit energizes the gospel. It is the Spirit that energizes the gospel. And these are just different ways of looking at the same dy dynamic work of the Spirit. But 1 Peter 1 says, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things. And that is speaking of the Old Testament prophets. In these things which now they have announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The gospel, when it is truly preached, listen, is preached by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Why do we say that? Why do we say that? Are we talking about some mystical power? Well, we're talking certainly about the divine power of the Holy Spirit. We're also talking about the gospel, which has been given to us. How? By inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know how many times you read this Bible, you don't understand what the Holy Spirit. Mm. So the Spirit, who is the author of the gospel, is also the one who energizes. He is the energizer. Those who preach the gospel to you, what the scripture says, by the Holy Spirit sent from where? From heaven. So again, the indication here is 
The Holy Spirit is the energizer of gospel preaching. Many times you come behind this podium or pulpit and you are tired. Your body is weak. You don't know who's have to tell you. Those who preach will know. Weak. Tired. But the Holy Spirit will energize you to preach the gospel. When you're finished and you lay on the bed, you're almost dead, not up. That's what he does. He energizes. First John 5 says what? The Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Whatever is a representation of the truth of Scripture comes from who? The Holy Spirit. And is therefore the witness of the Spirit. So, it is further energized by the Spirit. Go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we are just touching on these things ever so briefly in order to keep moving John chapter 3 I did an, an entire study on that chapter I hope you remember but in John chapter 3 it all comes it all kind of comes together here where Jesus has his conversation with a man named Nicodemus how can a man be born when he's old and that's talking about the new birth. Yeah, talking about how to get into the kingdom of God. Necessary to be born again. And then in verse 5, John chapter 3. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot. Enter the kingdom or into the kingdom of God because that which is born of flesh and that which is born of the spirit what is the point? the point is that the spirit make a note, regenerates the spirit regenerates so let's recap the spirit convicts of sin one Righteousness and judgment. It is the spirit that does that. It is the spirit that does that. The spirit produces repentance by means of that conviction. Number two. The spirit produces repentance by means of that conviction. Number three. The spirit energizes gospel preaching. And next, the spirit then regenerates. So if there's regeneration, that's another word for born again. Yeah. If there is regeneration, if there is regeneration, you have to conclude that it is because of the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. If there is regeneration, it's because of the Spirit. Yeah. Sometimes in these modern day preachers are taking glory for themselves. It is God who causes people to be born again. Anybody who's regenerated, it's because the Spirit has done that. Why? Because the Spirit gives life. And so there's a little theological debate. Theology is not easy. There's a little debate we have among ourselves. We say to people on the street, you need to give your life to Christ. That's to a sinner. That's all. You need to give your life to Christ. And among ourselves, well, the theologians, we argue, how could we give our life to Christ when we are dead in sin? <laughs> the life that the sinner is going to give, he's dead in his sin. He doesn't have any life. Because in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came. Such a man have life. But these theologians, so we ask them to give their lives. They say, well, we don't ask them to give their lives. They must accept the life that Christ, oh God, oh God, came to give them. Because without him, they have no life. Go figure. The Spirit gives life. That's why we're talking about being what? Born of the Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. In Titus chapter 3, it says in verse 5, He saves 
He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's the word of God. It is the Spirit who renews and regenerates. Those are almost synonyms in that passage. Renews and regenerates. So, the whole work of salvation then, the whole work of salvation is a work of the Spirit of God. Yet he tells us to play a part. But don't get it twisted. We have a part to play. But God alone saves. Amen. Mm. Amen. He says we must go and tell. That's why if you tell somebody about Jesus and the person rejects you, that's fine. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. But sometimes we think we are the ones to save people. Hello. You can't do it. You're going to be frustrated. It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. We have unsaved relatives. Pray for them. It is the Holy Ghost that has to produce repentance. We will love to save our children. We can't. It's the Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. And the preaching of the word that will cause conviction of sin. He is the author of scripture, which is the source of truth about sin. You want to know about sin? It is in the Bible. That is the source of truth about righteousness and about judgment. He's the author of scripture, which is the call to repentance. He's the author of scripture, which is gospel truth. It is he, Holy Spirit, through the proclamation of scripture, convicts, produces repentance. Energizes gospel preaching and witness and regenerate. In other words, give new life. Now, that is not all that the Spirit does. That's the initial work. Remember, we are studying the Holy Spirit, class 101. That's not all He does, that's the initial work. And there are a lot of ways to see that in the general flow of the New Testament teaching. So let me give you a couple of illustrations. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And here we get a little broader look at this initial ministry of the Holy Spirit. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has what? Chosen you. See all those things we can preach an entire year. Because being chosen is one of the aspects of salvation. Oh God. One of the aspects of salvation is that eternal selection. God chose you. So we have somebody who will say to me, well, if God chose us, so he knew beforehand, when we read Romans, he whom he knew, he predestined and so on. So why then worry? Because apparently God seems to know who will be saved and who will be not be saved? The answer to that is, while God has chosen you in eternity past, God has made the gospel preach to everybody. The Bible says of Peter, he's not willing. But that all, but yes, he knows who will be saved. But he never kept the key. Everybody will hear the gospel. Second Thessalonians, because God has chosen you from the beginning for what? Salvation. How? Through sanctification. By who is the agent of it? The Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, and faith in truth. In the truth. So we are not talking here about progressive sanctification. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the sanctification here that is synonymous with salvation. And sanctification often is synonymous with salvation. 
The word sanctification simply means to be set apart. It means to be cleansed. It means to be separated. That's what salvation is. We are separated from sin. We are separated from iniquity. We are separated from condemnation. One says they are day for now. No condemnation to those who are in. We are separated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. That's what it is. So, initial salvation is a launch of sanctification. It is a separation. And that's what we're talking about here. Because he says, for salvation through a sanctification. And it is that kind of sanctification that saves you. And it is by the spirit and faith in the truth. So salvation happens in perfect combination of believing the truth. You have to believe. Nobody is saved because you come to the building. Nobody is saved because you pay tithes and give offerings. You cannot be saved because you live in a house where your parents are saved. Oh God, I was You must believe when you hear the word of truth that's how you'll say. When it's the truth is proclaimed, and then you will experience the glorious power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he sets us apart. What is that? Sanctification. That is salvation. He sets us apart. We are not and should not be as the world anymore. The two scriptures. Somebody asked me the other day, so Pastor, you know, I was reading the Bible, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. And then in John, the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, it says, or second, love not the world, neither the things in the world. And the person said, Pastor, you know, the Bible has contradiction. They said, hold it. Hold it. That's why I'm planning sometime I don't know when. I have so many things in my head I want to do. That I want to do how to interpret the Bible. I'm going to teach that. It's going to take a while. How do you interpret the Bible? So I said to the person, Chanel, um, uh, we seem to be having contradiction. One time God says, the Bible says he loves the world. I said, no, you have to understand. There's something called Greek. There are two different Greek words that are used for world. One is cosmos. And the other one is ethnos. Why did they use the two different words? Because they're two different points that God is making. Going into all the world, that's ethnos. That means all people groups. Everybody must hear the gospel. Oh God, of course. Oh God. He loves the world, meaning the people. Come on, man. Come on, come on, come on. But when the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. The writer uses a different Greek word. Why? Because the word means don't love the thinking. The world system of thinking. Don't think like them, don't behave like them. That's a different concept from loving the people. So there's another way of saying everything I've said. That he convicts, that he causes repentance, and that he gives the gospel power and he regenerates. It's just another way of saying all the same thing all the time. And so there are many other things that the Holy Spirit does, but everything starts with his mighty work of what? Salvation. And by the way, Please don't tell people when they come to Christ, everything is going to be all right. Stop it. Don't do it. And when you pray this week, let me tell you, we should pray for the will of God. 
I wanted to spend a week teaching, but I'm so busy. When you pray, the first thing is, Jesus said to them in John chapter 14, when you pray, say, our Father. First thing we should do, our prayer should be directed to God the Father. Jesus said, when you talk to God the Father, you must ask for it in my name. So when you pray, it must be, I come to you, Father. Why? Because the principle he's teaching, there is only one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. When you begin your prayer, say, Oh, Father, my Father, we come to you. Number two, I didn't get the chance to teach. We must understand that when we pray, you are not praying to tell God how to do things. The Bible says, listen, we should pray about everything. But you must understand some things God will not grant us. Why? Because James says, when you pray, pray according to his thank you. If it is not his will, sometimes we pray to God as though we want to tell him what to do and how to do it. By the way, as I'm on, God, God, I'm finished. I'm already off topic. By the way, as I'm on that, hear me very carefully. Hear me carefully. Human beings can't remember the past. We know a little bit about the present, and we know nothing about the future. How dare we trust in ourselves? When you pray to God for healing or for anything and it doesn't happen, don't stop praying. I would hear people say, I've been praying and nothing happened. I remember I was at a funeral service of a late bishop in Trinidad and Tobago, Bishop Tornan Nelson, tremendous man of God. And I remember people were so overcome with grief. They wanted to know how come. Those are questions people ask. Listen, if I drop and die tomorrow, don't be asking no questions how come. And I want nobody praying for bringing me back. I gone. <laughs> don't start no thing for I gone. Who tell you I won't come back? When I behold Jesus. Who's the darling of my soul to be in his breath? <laughs> Christ crocodile did stop that. I can't understand the church to be absent from this body. We like to quote it, but when we die, what is wrong with you? Cry and stop. You must stop crying. Because the person knows the Lord. Ooh, it's going to be a glorious time up in heaven. Amen. Uh, see my Jackson. Oh. Up in heaven. Yeah. Ooh, see my Savior. Yeah. You come and the person said, Oh God, our bishop died and so on. So. And I know it happened because I heard it recently, Dr. Lewis. I heard it. People have been praying for God to touch them. People have been praying for a job. And he didn't answer. Listen to me very carefully. Here's what you're going to do from tomorrow. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Whatever you pray for. And if God has not given you the answer, keep on praying. Because some things, you don't know why he's withholding them from you. Because he alone is, what the elder says, omniscient. He alone is all knowing all powerful. He alone knows the future. So if he doesn't give it to you, don't stop. Still ask him. 
But you must always end your prayer by saying, if it is you. Yeah. Some people have been praying for a husband long now. Or a wife. God has not granted them. They give up and they go and find one. They're going to help God out. Abraham did that. Take my servant, hey God. You always produce problems. When we come to pray, don't come with your own mindset. Come and ask him, what is your will for this situation? What is your will for the general presbytery of power? What is your will, Father? What is your will for the vaccination program? Let you remember Jesus? What Jesus said in the garden of get seventy, get seventy. If it is possible, is you want to take this with any enemy of it by saying, right? So that means whatever you want for me. And his will was so that you die on that cross. That is the will of God. When you pray, you want to go overseas and study. Pray and say, what is, oh God, I want to say. And if it is not your will, don't allow me to have it, Father. Close the door, because if it is not your will, and I still pursue it, it is going to cause me headache and heartaches. Because James says when you pray, Pray according to his will. Bobby, have you